a simple suggestion. And I was like, are you crazy? Like me painting on stage in front of people? Leads to a fulfilling profession. I've been able to do stuff with Tim Tebow to Jerry Rice to Jack Nicholas. You'll meet the man who's creating art and touching lives in the process. Plus, a member of New York's finest and a 9-11 hero confronts his inner demons on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And recently, 20-year-old Walter Carr of Homewood, Alabama made quite a first impression on his new employer. The night before his first day for a moving company, Walter's car broke down. So Walter started walking at midnight, 20 miles just to get there. If you were wondering, he made it. And two days later, his boss, CEO of Bellhop Moving, and the family of the home he was packing up were on hand for a big surprise. I'd like to give you this car right here um, today, like right now. Like you can drive away with it. Wow, we're all good. This, yeah, man. Uh, you know, not. But, but it, it works. Yeah, it served my family and I really well. I think it'll serve yours. You've changed all of our lives. Walter, you have no idea how many lives you've changed and inspired. You have no idea. You're a very special young man. You're going to do great things. You already have. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you so much. Well, wow, that is incredible. Walter is very special. And just to walk 20 miles to be there uh, for your first day at work at a moving company, a lot of people would have called in and said, I can't, can't make, make it. Can't make it. Car broke down. Uh, right? But here he is. He leaves at midnight in order to make it. Uh, that is absolutely incredible. And yeah. what an inspiration. That, yeah. Well, every employer is looking for Walter. <laughs> That's great. Well, a frightening scene in New Orleans last week is an SUV plunged four stories from a parking garage before crashing below with the driver still inside. Now, the extent of the man's injuries are unknown. However, he is expected to survive. One of the men who rushed in to help turn the car over was New Orleans Saints lineman Mitchell Lowen. Lowen was having brunch with his wife and son nearby when he heard a noise he said sounded like an explosion. Lowen, a Christian, said of the driver, he didn't say much. He was just thanking us all. I hugged him and told him he was going to be okay, and then I prayed with him. It was a life-changing experience. I just did what I had to do, and I wasn't thinking about anything else. I felt like I was being led by God to go help that man. Four uh, stories. Four Ooh. stories, and to uh, walk into that and say, okay, I'm going to help that man. Yeah. yeah you go. Well, when her 35th birthday plans fell through, Cristala Poole decided to turn her focus on helping others. The Houston native settled on doing 35 random acts of kindness, including paying for someone's gas, covering a woman's bus fare, and delivering a meal to a homeless person. That's when the man blessed her with the birthday serenade. Take a look. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God told me that that was him. This is like the best birthday present ever <laughs> for my 35th. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> and I will show hungry. Wow. Gustavo was so impressed with the man whose name is Maurice. She returned three days later and bought him some more necessities. And um, that, he's Boy, got quite a Way to go. What a great way to turn your birthday into something that a lot of people are celebrating for good reason. Well, the first time that artist Jared Emerson painted on stage, he was scared to death. Today, he's widely known not only for his paintings, but for his live performances. Take a look. Tucked alongside the Reedy River in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, are the popular art crossing galleries. There you'll find Jared Emerson, an artist who not only paints works of art, he performs them. A number of his performances have been portraits of celebrities who are sometimes in the audience. 
I've been able to do stuff with Tim Tebow, to Jerry Rice, to Jack Nicholas, uh, Carrie Underwood. It can be a little nerve wracking. But the pieces he loves creating most are those that point people to Jesus Christ. You start out creating things for your own enjoyment, your own pleasure. And then as you grow a little bit, you realize, well, maybe I'm creating something because other people need to see it. When you're painting, um, you don't realize the impact that it's having on other people a lot until they come and tell you about it. But to have someone come to you and say, man, um, you know, I, I just haven't been coming to church in a while, or I, I just been falling from God, and, and that painting really spoke to me. For some reason, in seeing that painting of Jesus, it was like him telling me, hey, I'm here. Jared was brought up in a Christ-centered home in Michigan. He remembers when his own faith in God became real when he was five. But I knew for me, my heart changed. And so instead of me thinking I was a filthy rag, I realized that I was actually his child and he loved me regardless of um, whether I obeyed or disobeyed. I just know that uh, I wanted to, as I grew older, to please him more and uh, learn and try to please myself less. He discovered his gift for art around seventh grade, but he had other things on his mind. At a young age, I wanted to play basketball. That was my dream, my hopes, my ambitions. Sports was my life. Being an artist wasn't really something that I thought I could be one day. Even so, Jared continued honing his artistic skills. It wasn't until after spending a year in Bible college and working in sales a couple of years that he decided to pursue a career as an artist. I think it started with me understanding the path that I was going down was trying to figure out how to be successful, how to make a living, how to have a family take care of them with art. Within a few years, he discovered how God wanted him to use his gift. It started when Jared's church made some videos of him painting and showed them during their services. And then they said, Jared, you should paint on stage. And, and I was like, are you crazy? Like me painting on stage in front of people? Like that's not something that I do. I was scared to death to be able to get in front of people and paint something. He'll never forget his first performance with an injured knee. And I realized I am on a slick surface. I have a bum knee. The paint starts seeping into the canvas. And so my first thought is selfishly, hey, what am I doing up here? I'm gonna come up here, throw some paint, fall down, and what's the purpose of that? And then my next thought was, God, I need your help. Despite his fears, it was a big hit. For me, it was the Holy Spirit just hit me and said, Jared, listen, if I can allow you to do something when you're broken, literally, and not 100%, look at the possibilities when you are 100% and the opportunities that I'll be able to give you to not only just get out there and throw paint, but bring honor and glory to, to my name. And it wasn't until I think I, I realized to let go and not have total control and let God take control that I changed my path. And that kind of brought me down to doing like the speed painting, the live performance art, where it became a ministry. Requests for Jared's performances started coming in from all directions, allowing him to open his Greenville studio in 2006. Now he works at conferences, cruises, and gatherings of all kinds, doing what he loves and sharing his faith. And I never could really imagine or dream that I'd be doing the things that I'm doing today if it wasn't for that decision of, God, I need you to take over and take control of my life versus me trying to do it. So for me, it always comes back full circle. Jared, where, where is your heart today? How focused are you on my son? And not just creating art, but hopefully touching lives in the process. I know I can't touch a life, but I know God can touch a life. And if it's through art, then how cool is that? Wow. That is incredible. It takes me back to <laughs> kindergarten when I used to do finger painting. I haven't done that in a long time. I but bet yours wasn't like Jared's. No. <laughs> you, you were right in that bed. <laughs> wow. What, I mean, I'm I, watching. I was having trouble staying within the lines. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't stay in the lines either. <laughs> he makes his own lines. Yeah, I, but how amazing. I watch him spray all of that up there, throw it all up there, and you wonder, how does he see? The, he sees the finished he product it. before it's even on the right. canvas. Amazing. What a gift. Well, up next, she was raised by a drug-dealing mother in a Nairobi slum. 
Find out how that all changed with a little help from CBN. Don't go away. Twelve-year-old Vivian lives in Kenya. Today she has a good life, hope for a happy future, and she's surrounded by love. It's a stark contrast to the life she once lived, and she never takes it for granted. Vivian grew up in a Nairobi slum where her mother was a drug dealer. I felt like my mother didn't love me. She didn't give me enough food. She brought a lot of bad people to the house, and I was always afraid. I felt like God had forgotten me, and I wanted to cry every day. I was alone in the world. Then Vivian was taken in by Living Faith International, a ministry supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. Here at this home, Vivian and the other kids are surrounded by people that love them. They have three good meals a day, and they're getting a great education. Most importantly, they're learning about God. Did you guys have school today? When I first came here, I didn't know anything about God. Learning about God was a very nice thing to me. Now I feel like I have a father who cares for me and loves me. Vivian and the others often watch Superbook at home. My favorite story is the story of Joseph. When he was sold by his brothers, God still had a plan for him. I have forgiven my mother the way Joseph forgave his brothers. No matter what someone does to you, if you forgive, it will set you free. Through Superbook and the consistent Christian care she gets at the home, Vivian is learning to rely on God. When I was struggling with my science test, I stopped and prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to help me. God helped me remember what I learned, and I got 100% on the test. Vivian even found it in her heart to pray for her mother. I pray that God will bless her and that she will prosper and one day be saved. Living in this wonderful home encouraged me to love God. Thank you for giving us this privilege. We don't take it for granted. May God bless you for blessing us. Such wisdom from the mouth of such a young girl. You know, Vivian has found a father who will never leave her or forsake her. She's found a family. The Bible says God puts the lonely in families. That's where Vivian is today. She's in a wonderful home supported by Orphan's Promise. And as you heard her so clearly say, she's not only found a father, she's understood some of the secrets to joy and freedom. She's learned to forgive what's been done to her wrongly, and by that has been set free. This little girl is going somewhere, and you've helped to make that possible. I just want to say thank you. Orphan's Promise is CBN's outreach to vulnerable and orphaned children around the world, and you really are making a difference, so we say thank you. If you'd like to be a part of what we're doing, you can do that by calling our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and let us know what you'd like to give, and we welcome your involvement in what we do in Jesus' name. Gordon? Well, still to come, a member of New York City's finest who saw the worst of humanity, and that was before 9-11. I couldn't process that in my brain. It was just building and building and building. The pressure was just building. One of the guys I work with, he said, you know, you look like you're gonna explode. Watch this cop confront his inner demons when we return. After the 9-11 attacks, Andrew Columbia was a dependable helper. At a time when his fellow neighbors and countrymen were struggling, Andrew was a shoulder to lean on, thanks to a showdown he once had with God. I went down there the day after the attacks took place. I was on the task force with other pastors and ministers. There was this eerie silence. There were people all over the place, but nobody was talking. I was in shock, and I was praying, Lord, give me the strength to be able to minister here. I grew up in uh, Staten Island, New York. I thought I lived a pretty normal life like most kids. 
My mother and father, we were nominal churchgoers. I excelled in sports. I, I, I did well in school when I applied myself, but there was just something inside. I always felt like there was something wrong with me, and I didn't know why. I didn't handle rejection well. If somebody didn't like me, it really bothered me. I would say, what's wrong with me? Why do I feel afraid? Why do I feel insecure? When you're feeling insecure, it's hard to think you're worthy of anything. Was I worthy of love? Hmm. I don't know. That kind of festered over the years. And then as I got older and went into my teen years, that's where the anger started coming in. There were times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be literally shaking. I knew in my heart that there was something deep that wasn't right. I was afraid to deal with it. January 20th of 1987, 21 years old, I was a, a macho guy. I didn't look afraid. I didn't look insecure. And I think I had most people fooled. Then I become a cop. Now I have a platform to be aggressive. Now I have an outlet for anger. I would not take crap from nobody. If, if you were gonna say something to me that I didn't like, I was gonna give it back to you. And I don't care if you were a sergeant or a captain or whoever. This one sergeant in particular, he goes, Columbia, I'm sending you to the Fighting Ninth. And I said, the Fighting Ninth, where's that? He goes, that's the Lower East Side of Manhattan, just where you belong. Well, the Lower East Side from mid to late 80s into the 90s was one of the roughest areas in New York City. It was the drug capital of the country. And the symbol for the precinct was an outhouse. It was a precinct where you got your hands dirty. There probably wasn't a week that went by that I wasn't breaking up a fight, dealing with an emotionally disturbed person, someone who's whacked out on drugs or just crazy. I saw situations where little children were raped. Three-year-olds bleeding, uh, crying. I couldn't process that in my brain. When I saw a child being hurt, I wanted vengeance. It would infuriate me. If a woman was beat up by her boyfriend, he was gonna pay. I'm seeing this stuff every day, trying to be a father and a husband and raise a family. I got the pressure of the job. It was just building and building and building. The pressure was just building. One of the guys I work with, he said, you know, Columbia, you look like you're gonna explode. Now it's like, okay, you're found out. You can't hide it anymore. That night, I decided to have a showdown with God. I went up to that roof that night, and I began to curse at God and scream at God. Everything that was in me, all that emotion, all that anger, all that frustration, I just had to let it out. And I took my gun out and I waved it in the air and I said, God, if you're real and you're there, what's stopping me from blowing my brains out right now? I wanna know what's wrong with me. What is wrong with me? I wanna know now. And when I did that, that's where everything changed. Words came out of my mouth. You were molested as a child. And I said, God, if that's real, I want another sign. And the words came out of my mouth again. You were molested as a child. And I said, God, if that's real, I want another sign. And the third time, I felt this presence that I never felt before, this light encased around me. I just felt love. It was the answer to my fear. It was the answer to my insecurity. It was the answer to my pain. I saw God as this loving father who cared enough about me to be honest with me. He exposed the deepest secret in my life that I was afraid to face or deal with. And he gave me a whole new life. You know, one of the things we had to do was on a Sunday morning, we'd have to walk up 10 flights of stairs to go to the top of buildings when we get a call Sunday morning. 
to chase the homeless guys off the roof. I would get up there and I was mean to those guys. After I got saved, I remember one time I went up to the roof. There was this guy, urine and vomit all over. And I looked at this guy and, and I was overwhelmed with compassion. And I walked over to him and I said, do you know that God loves you? Do you know that? And this man started crying. And I hugged him and I prayed with that man on the roof. God changed my heart so much that what he did for me, I knew he can do for anyone else. People went through this traumatic event of 9-11 on so many levels. They were so traumatized by that event, it affected other events in their life. And I was able to help people process that. It was a beautiful thing to be able to help people in that time. I believe this, there's a time and season for every human being to have their encounter with God. And for me, it was 26 years old. Ecclesiastes 3, it says there's a time and a season for everything. And God's waiting for people to see if he's real. And he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to see if he is real. And he'll show up for you if you just ask him. How do you do that? Well, it's very simple. It's a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're there, if you're real, if you really are my Savior, could you show me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, here's the scripture for you. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you will find me. That's the key. It's not the words you say, it's your heart and what's your heart orientation. Now for Andrew, he showed his heart on a rooftop and it, was, it wasn't pretty. He's yelling at God, he's cursing God. Uh, well, why is this this way? You've got me in the worst precinct in New York City. I'm seeing the worst of humanity. I'm seeing things that I, I can't explain, I can't justify. All it does in me is trigger anger uh, I want to get back. I want revenge. Uh, I want to do things to people. What was that all about? Well, God showed up for him. In the middle of all his cursing, God showed up for him. Not just once, not just twice, but three times. And he showed Andrew that he's real. And he showed him what the source of all that anger was, that at a time in his childhood, he was molested. And that was triggering all the anger, all the explosion. He had gone through horrible trauma. But the wonderful thing is, God showed up in love to say, I can take all of that. I can make you new. I can change you from your innermost being. The anger you used to feel, the revenge you used to feel, the striking out you used to do, all of that, I can change all of it. To, well, you're, you will see someone. You'll see somebody in his own vomit, his own excrement, uh, his own pit on a rooftop, and you'll be able to reach out to them and say, God loves you, and give them a hug. If you want this, if you want this change, right now with me, let's say that same prayer and let Jesus show up for you. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud. I hear you're there. I hear that you're real. I hear that you show up for other people. So Jesus, I want that. I want you in my life and in my heart. Forgive me, change my life, change me from my innermost being. And if you'll do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. 
Hear my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, let somebody know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day.